I was thinking about all the new vocabularies that are emerging to try to identify ways to describe all these climate anxiety related things that we're feeling. And I kind of went down a rabbit hole one time and was kind of perusing this lexicon and just all the things that were out there and record breaking, broken record, record breaking definitely comes to mind that, you know, the constant headlines. I feel nowadays that, you know, I just kind of put the newspaper away. At that point, I don't even read those stories. In the same vein that I don't look away, I feel I have enough information that I know I will be committed to this forever. And then at a certain point, constant bombardment is just emotionally unsustainable. So I feel, you know, I'm looking ahead, I'm seeing what's there. I have the information. I, I'm learning what resources and talents and gifts I have that I can contribute. But I, yeah, I have to say there is a lot of um, avoidance. I feel like even outside of school and friends who are in school studying this and just kind of the constant interaction, thinking about these topics. But how do I feel some days? Um, yeah, hard to say what is general anxiety and what is climate anxiety. Um, but yeah, it's pretty constant. The impact of the climate crisis is wreaking havoc. Bomb cyclone. Exceptional drought. Once in a century weather event. Record breaking heat. Unprecedented storm. The evidence is everywhere. I think as you get older and you work in this field longer, you learn how to compartmentalize your anxieties, but there's always those moments where you kind of break down. Uh, my last one was when the IPCC report came out, just this report that keeps coming out and saying things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And so I just sat there, I was like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? I just feel crappy all the time. I'm not making a difference. I sat in my bed and cried for 10 minutes because you just like realize like the daunting nature of the challenge we have ahead of us. It's just those times where, you know, hope is hard to find when you're just reading like really, really sad stuff. I guess I learned about climate change when I was uh, in sixth grade. I, I remember when I learned about it. And um, so like ever since then, it's been sort of this like looming cloud. Um, and it still sort of feels like a looming cloud. It's, it's like getting closer and closer, but it's, it's hard to make that transition from like, it feels like a looming cloud to like feeling like, okay, you're in the downpour because we are in the downpour. Being alive makes me think about climate change. You know, I'm always sort of thinking about it. I was born in Beijing, but raised in New Haven. Once every couple summers, my family would visit family in Beijing um, and I was just so struck by the smog that was visible wherever, whenever, and that really left an impact on me. Yeah, I have kind of a, a split in my family where um, I think my dad has been pushed by me to become more involved and more knowledgeable and more active and more concerned. and. Um, and then um, my older brother and my, my mom aren't so concerned. It's hard when uh, the thing that most dominates your life and the thing you've built your life around and it's so close to your own identity, um, it's not even acknowledged as being real or existing. Like nobody our age, nobody who's under 30 has ever experienced a colder than average year, just in our lifetimes, you know, and it's... <laughs> It's sad to 
think about the lives that our grandparents had and the lives that our parents had and think, except maybe that those possibilities, that kind of lifestyle isn't going to be there for us. Like the lives that they had aren't possible for us. And in some ways, accepting that makes it less scary because there's like less to lose. You know, everything is already on the line. So I went to COP26 last year and one of, I think my highlights was the tension that existed between, at least for myself, between me being in business attire, wearing my badge, um, being a delegate of Yale and uh, the company that I was, uh, the organization that I was working with at that time, and trying to be like an actual professional in the climate space within climate policy versus me being a 21 year old who feels so strongly and is so angry about climate change and the tension of am I allowed to be a climate activist when I'm trying to be a professional or like am I allowed to be an angry youth I think the thing that really drives my fear is what if we don't do enough <laughs> I really don't think there's a lot of places that are safe from climate change. I grew up in um, northeast, a northeastern part of San Diego, Southern California. Um, that was pretty close to the mountains. And so we evacuated our home about three or four times when I was a kid because of wildfires coming down. And, you know, as I got into college, it got just progressively worse where they canceled school for a few weeks because PG&E, the power company, shut off power um, for fear of igniting a wildfire. And one year during the campfire, the air quality was so bad, they handed out N95 respirators um, so that people could still come to class. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd lost neighbors to wildfire. Um, lost parts of our home to wildfire. It's, it was very real and it got progressively worse throughout my childhood. Um, drought was obviously, is obviously a very big problem in California. And it was so hard because we were just being met with the fundamental truth that we did not have enough water. And it just broke people. I mean, it just really like, this idea that you could run out of a natural resource that you just needed to live, to operate. Where I'm from, flooding's normal. So I'm from a small island off the coast of North Carolina, um, not the Outer Banks. Uh, <laughs> and um, it is an island that sits in the mouth of the Cape Fear River named, um, and the island's Baldhead Island. It has uh, hundreds and hundreds of turtles come and sea turtles come and nest there every year. I grew up <laughs> uh, roaming the beaches from like 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. tagging mo mother sea turtles and like counting eggs and going to conservancy camp. There have been pretty drastic changes. Um, so hurricane season has gotten longer and more intense. Um, and those are the obvious ones. So, you know, people report every year. <laughs> Storms are getting more frequent and worse. Um, but the things that you don't always see um, reported on, but, you know, people like the local ferryman 
talks about this and he doesn't believe in climate change, but he goes, yeah, you know, we're getting more and more of these tides that wash over. So there's this waiting area for the ferry terminal that is a, um, it's not on a floating dock. So if the tides get too high, it washes over the entire waiting area and you have to wade through to get on the boat. Um, and those used to happen like twice a year at most. And it would always be a funny day when I was gonna go to school and you had to like, I walked into school just covered in salt water. But now they're happening at least once a month. One day we'll have to say goodbye to Bald Head. It's incredibly saddening, um, especially because it's my home um, and like what got me interested in all this in the first place. I'm from uh, Columbia Crossroads, which is in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, in rural northern Pennsylvania. Big fracking county. Yep, the second most fracked county in the state, I think, last time I checked. I have 72 wellheads within like three miles of my house. We are going through faster climate change now than ever before in history. So just in the last maybe 10 years or so, I've noticed a lot of changes in the forests around my family's place. Um, for one, um, about 10 years ago was the first time that, uh, we, that I ever got a tick while while in the forest there, um, ticks just weren't, weren't around. Maybe six years ago, my mom actually noticed that a new frog came and she, she noticed it by the call. It was a wood frog and she always thought it had sort of a, a funny call. And then most recently, there's been a couple of other invasive species, non-native invasive species. Um, we've had uh, the emerald ash borer came about two years ago Hemlock woolly adelgid came about five years ago. Um, garlic mustard, I recently saw. Um, recently saw a Japanese stiltgrass there for the first time and barberry. And I, I wouldn't attribute all of these new species arrivals to climate change, but I think it's all very linked to climate change. Do you talk to your mom a lot about climate change? Yeah, I would say so. I think she's very concerned and um, but she, she's maybe, yeah, I'd say she's very concerned and um, is looking for reassurance maybe when she asked me about it. And um, she's wondering, just wondering what the future is going to be like. My parents have a lot of climate anxiety, which I think is really interesting um, given that they're older and they're immigrants, but they, yeah, we would go to climate protests a lot when I was a kid and they were early adopters of the electric car, but mostly had this sort of strong political conviction that this would be the, the great um, trouble of my lifetime. They feel, I think, a lot of sadness over the way climate change has altered the landscapes that they grew up in and they now live in. Both of my parents grew up in the south of India, which have now faced like monsoonal flooding almost every other year. Um, and I don't think they feel like they have a place they can go that won't ever be ravaged by climate change. Um, and I think that when I talk to my parents, they always ask me questions about my research and what I'm working on. And I think it's because they feel some sense of if someone's working on it, <laughs> then, then maybe it'll be okay. Do you feel climate change anxiety? I think in so many ways, I would normally say no. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to these huge, huge issues um, where, you know, the problem is truly crippling if you engage with it every day <laughs> um, and really overwhelming when you think about or you see the images of people who are suffering in this moment from climate change. Um, and then I'll think about all the people who could. Uh, and I think humans have this nice 
way of kind of disconnecting from that reality occasionally. Um, and it's actually a healthy thing. I don't think disconnecting from reality is always bad. Um, it's like the way you survive mentally with such big challenges. Um, and so I think I generally do that. Mm. But what's been interesting in the past year is that um, I've found myself less capable of mitigating that or like self-regulating my emotions um, because of other trauma. So I think that's another way that I think climate anxiety pops up. When my dad got sick uh, a little over a year and a half ago now, um, and then he passed within four months, um, you know, that was, you know, it, it rocked my world um, and, and totally shook everything up but I think what was the most interesting is even now, um, if I'm having a bad day with that, um, I am less capable of self-regulating. And so then other things seep in. Climate anxiety doesn't occur on its own. It occurs coupled with other things. Um, and so I think that would be the way it manifests. Um, and I think like an example um, that I wanted to tell you all, uh, which actually, <laughs> happened just this week, um, but is a good example is, was having one of those off nights thinking about my dad. Um, and those happen and you just have to like lean into the emotion and let it kind of run through you. Um, managed to fall asleep and then had it, one of my like recurring nightmares from childhood that I hadn't had in a while, which is one of those ones that it's so based in reality, you wanna like throw up when you wake up. Um, but it's one where um, a really, really bad hurricane has hit the island I'm from. Our home is like breaking apart. Um, the water is like getting higher and higher and I can't reach my parents. <laughs> and it's like those things that happen where it's like, that's how climate anxiety manifests. Um, when I'm almost like predisposed or like open and raw to like all the other emotions coming in. So, um, yeah, that's the way it kind of happens for me. And then it's, you wake up, and you like slowly just calm yourself back to sleep and just go on with your day because um, you have to. When I was in college, I would go through these, I was part of the fossil fuel divestment campaign at my university. And we would go to the uh, chief investment officer's um, office in Oakland and do sit-ins. Um, and he would always, he would always order like two meat lovers pizzas and be like, I bought you guys lunch, knowing that almost everyone there would not, was, you know, didn't eat meat. Um, and it was just this like really sort of emotionally manipulative move. Dude, I developed a, a tremor, a hand tremor that year. Um, and I would, you know, that's hard when you do lab, a lot of lab work. <laughs> It was a lot. It was pretty hard. I would not be able to, you know, do a lot of things in the lab because my hand would just constantly be shaking and and I would it would have a hard time going to sleep and things like that. And that's kind of when I started to very intentionally build these practices into my day uh, meditation, yoga, things like that, um, because it just became physically overwhelming um, and it just was so dispiriting to see this to see this like constant just rejection of of the severity of the situation um, and it, it yeah it has definitely manifested into into physical um, anxieties I guess so when I was younger, I, I would hear about climate change is going to be happening. It's happening. We're going to be seeing the changes. And now it's pretty clear we are seeing direct effects of climate change. And, and but there's, it's, I think that people sometimes want like more of a firm transition. Like now is the change. Now is when the climates are really changing. When it's a gradual shift, it's, it's hard to feel that. And so sometimes I wonder, like I hear about like, oh, it was another year that was the worst fires ever in the Western US or we're in the worst drought. And so I see headlines like that or, or hurricanes or what have you. 
And I'm like, wait, is this it? Like, is this that inflection point? Is this the moment? I don't know. And um, yeah, so I, and then I go about living my life and like, oh, okay, it's just like the normal, you know, like normal news. Like, is this going to be is something changing now? Is this the moment? <laughs> Are we screwed? I don't know how it ends for us. And I really, I really am, am a little scared to find out how it does. I mean, that's not, it's not an all or nothing. You know, there are degrees to screwed. And, um, you know, every degree, every quarter degree matters. If I say we're screwed, it's almost me just admitting to myself that I've given up and I don't want to do that because that is not the reality of things. I don't want this to become like a weird self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't think we're screwed because then I wouldn't be doing the work. If I thought it was truly a lost cause, yes, I'd leave it because quite frankly, I would rather spend my time doing something that I know would make an impact. And so I would probably switch and be a nurse or like do something where I'm working on human rights abuses. But back to the question of whether or not I think we're screwed. I, I, I do think it depends on who you are in this world. Like the rich and powerful will be fine. The less fortunate, not as much. God, that's depressing. But ultimately, you know what? I, I want to be more hopeful and optimistic. <laughs> the million dollar question. Um, no, I don't. I think if we're, I think if you want to think about climate change as some like thing that will be solved will be solved, then yeah. I, but I don't think we are fundamentally screwed because I do think now we have this window of opportunity where a lot of smart people are doing a lot of good things. But like, yeah, coral reefs are maybe screwed <laughs> certain places, certain species. But I, I do think that we're on a trajectory right now of positivity in the climate space. Like we're getting things done. so much tension is you know do we talk about our grief and then sometimes people say oh but then you're not going to get more people in people don't come to feel sad you know you need to talk about hope and I do want to talk about hope I do want to talk about that joy and the wonder like a hepatica blooming in spring or the fact that slime molds can cogitate like can we talk about this you know um I do want to talk about those things um but there's also grief and that's real and there's not a lot of space for that right now so that's the tension and the tension of responsibility i want to feel responsibility i want to take responsibility 
I don't want to feel carefree and relaxed or unencumbered or untied to place and to each other and to what's happening. I want to be able to look ahead and see what's there and not turn away. We all need a little bit of hope, otherwise we wouldn't be able to get up and do what we do, right? Like, if, if our field were totally hopeless, would we still be in this field? Maybe we would, um, but I think that most of our classmates at YSC do feel a little bit of hope maybe more than a little bit of hope. Another big thing that actively gives me hope every time I think or see it is like youth climate activists. I think the fact that people that young are thinking so hard and taking to the streets to have their voice heard, I think is so incredibly empowering. And, and yeah, no, it just gives me a lot of hope to see that they are already doing so much. What brings you joy? I find joy very often in small things. I think joy is kind of a culmination of, um, of small delights that have built into something big. Cycling brings me a lot of joy. There's actually this amazing history of um, women starting to cycle and the uh, feminist movement and the passage of the 19th Amendment and they're really interrelated, this idea of a freedom of movement and even changes in, in dress and outfits so that you could move around. And it brings so much joy to me that um, it's hard to explain because it's always thought of as a construct. Oh, you only have a bike, you don't have a car, how sad. Um, that must be hard for you. Um, and it doesn't constrict me, you know, it, it opens up possibilities and how I interact with my community and my landscape and um, my health and well-being. I have a world that I wish could happen, right? I have this perfect world where like all these things are put into place. And so we're never gonna really reach my world and that's okay, but at least I can work toward how I want the world to be better. There's all these things that are good in life. And so I do work in a negative field, but I think we should just try to have fun, but like also work toward doing something good. What about climate change makes you the most uneasy? I don't feel like I've said, I've said this to you. It's just the future has disappeared and we don't know what to do about it. It's weird to be born in a time too where that's the case. And this isn't like a new thing in human history. Like people have been born into times where like the future is super uncertain. We're very small. And like to put the weight of the world on our shoulders as individuals and feel anxiety around something like climate change because we're not doing enough or because we are the hero that's going to save this or right this ship and we're not doing the work to right the ship right now or can't figure out how to do that in any given point in time. I think that's where a lot of the actual like emotional anxiety comes from. I don't um, feel climate anxiety anymore in the way that I used to. And I think that's mostly a matter of being, having, being able to let it fuel my work as opposed to let it just internally eat away at me. Don't know if this is true for everybody. I think that spending too much time basking in that anxiety can like go one of two ways. It can like, um, break people down to the point of like not being able to do anything just bailing on it just being like I mean you could you could take the perspective of um, well nothing I can do matters and so like I'm gonna just go go to Coachella every year <laughs> and uh, uh, drink as much as I possibly can and like that like makes sense in my head as a response in some ways if you take all the 
sort of worst case scenario climate projections as true. And I think for me, it's, it has been constructive. I think that as things get worse, I will have to look for spiritual solace outside of myself. I think it will become a much more community-based activity. The sense of anxiety, the sense of um, suffering will have to be shared collectively and we will have to build communities around one another um, and learn to move outside of ourselves and outside of the sort of individualistic perspective that we've all grown up on. Um, in the hopes of finding some sense of understanding um, and peace that others can support you, can take some of that suffering from you and that you can do the same for them. Literally, as I was walking in to do this interview, this book was on the table and I picked it up, Pandemic Chronicles, so like what's happening with this? And I open it and the very first thing is a quote by Toni Morrison. This is precisely the time when artists go to work. There's no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. That's kind of how I feel of great, we're even more needed now, and there's just really no other alternative, and whatever your skill, whatever your resource, whatever your story is, um, we need you. Where am I going to get a drink? <laughs> Where are we going? Can you hear the call? Do the wood frog call? Yeah, it's like. <laughs> 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 <laughs>